Biofeedback, Wikipedia article audio. Biofeedback is the process of gaining greater awareness of many physiological functions primarily using instruments that provide information on the activity of those same systems, with the goal of being able to manipulate them at will. Some of the processes that can be controlled include brain waves, muscle tone, skin conductance, heart rate, and pain perception. Biofeedback may be used to improve health, performance, and the physiological changes that often occur in conjunction with changes to thoughts, emotions, and behavior. Eventually, these changes may be maintained without the use of extra equipment, for no equipment is necessarily required to practice biofeedback. Definition Information Coded Biofeedback Biofeedback has been found to be effective for the treatment of headaches and migraines. Three professional biofeedback organizations, the Association for Applied Psychophysiology and Biofeedback, Biofeedback Certification International Alliance, and the International Society for Neurofeedback and Research, arrived at a consensus definition of biofeedback in 2008. Is a process that enables an individual to learn how to change physiological activity for the purposes of improving health and performance. Precise instruments measure physiological activity such as brain waves, heart function, breathing, muscle activity, and skin temperature. These instruments rapidly and accurately feed back information to the user. The presentation of this information often in conjunction with changes in thinking, emotions, and behavior supports desired physiological changes. Over time, these changes can endure without continued use of an instrument. Information-coded biofeedback is an evolving form and methodology in the field of biofeedback. Its uses may be applied in the areas of health, wellness, and awareness. Biofeedback has its modern conventional roots in the early 1970s. Over the years, biofeedback as a discipline and a technology has continued to mature and express new versions of the method with novel interpretations in areas utilizing the electromyograph, electrodermograph, electroencephalograph, and electrocardiogram among others. The concept of biofeedback is based on the fact that a wide variety of ongoing intrinsic natural functions of the organism occur at a level of awareness generally called the unconscious. The biofeedback process is designed to interface with select aspects of these unconscious processes. Sensor Modalities The definition reads Biofeedback is a process that enables an individual to learn how to change physiological activity for the purposes of improving health and performance. Precise instruments measure physiological activity such as brain waves, heart function, breathing, muscle activity, and skin temperature. These instruments rapidly and accurately feed back information to the user. The presentation of this information often in conjunction with changes in thinking, emotions, and behavior supports desired physiological changes. Over time, these changes can endure without continued use of an instrument. A more simple definition could be, biofeedback is the process of gaining greater awareness of many physiological functions primarily using instruments that provide information on the activity of those same systems, with the goal of being able to manipulate them at will. Electromyograph In both of these definitions, a cardinal feature of the concept is the association of the will with the result of a new cognitive learning skill. Some examine this concept and do not necessarily ascribe it simply to a willful acquisition of a new learned skill but also extend the dynamics into the realms of a behavioristic conditioning. 
Behaviorism contends that it is possible to change the actions and functions of an organism by exposing it to a number of conditions or influences. Key to the concept is not only that the functions are unconscious but that conditioning processes themselves may be unconscious to the organism. Information-coded biofeedback relies primarily on the behavior conditioning aspect of biofeedback in promoting significant changes in the functioning of the organism. The principle of information is both complex and, in part, controversial. The term itself is derived from the Latin verb informare which means literally to bring into form or shape. The meaning of information is largely affected by the context of usage. Probably the simplest and perhaps most insightful definition of information was given by Gregory Battison Information is news of change or another as the difference that makes a difference. Information may also be thought of as any type of pattern that influences the formation or transformation of other patterns. Recognizing the inherent complexity of an organism, information-coded biofeedback applies algorithmic calculations in a stochastic approach to identify significant probabilities in a limited set of possibilities. An electromyograph uses surface electrodes to detect muscle action potentials from underlying skeletal muscles that initiate muscle contraction. Clinicians record the surface electromyogram using one or more active electrodes that are placed over a target muscle and a reference electrode that is placed within 6 inches of either active. The SEMG is measured in microvolts. Feedback Thermometer In addition to surface electrodes, Clinicians may also insert wires or needles intramuscularly to record an EMG signal. While this is more painful and often costly, the signal is more reliable since surface electrodes pick up crosstalk from nearby muscles. The use of surface electrodes is also limited to superficial muscles, making the intramuscular approach beneficial to access signals from deeper muscles. The electrical activity picked up by the electrodes is recorded and displayed in the same fashion as the surface electrodes. Prior to placing surface electrodes, the skin is normally shaved, cleaned, and exfoliated to get the best signal. Raw EMG signals resemble noise and the voltage fluctuates, therefore they are processed normally in three ways, rectification, filtering, and integration. This processing allows for a unified signal that is then able to be compared to other signals using the same processing techniques. Electrodermograph Biofeedback therapists use EMG biofeedback when treating anxiety and worry, chronic pain, computer-related disorder, essential hypertension, headache, low back pain physical rehabilitation, temporomandibular joint dysfunction, torticollis and fecal incontinence, urinary incontinence, and pelvic pain. Physical therapists have also used EMG biofeedback for evaluating muscle activation and providing feedback for their patients. Electroencephalograph a feedback thermometer detects skin temperature with a thermistor that is usually attached to a finger or toe and measured in degrees Celsius or Fahrenheit. Skin temperature mainly reflects arteriole diameter. Hand warming and hand cooling are produced by separate mechanisms, and their regulation involves different skills. Hand warming involves arteriole vasodilation produced by a beta-2 adrenergic hormonal mechanism. Hand cooling involves arteriole vasoconstriction produced by the increased firing of sympathetic C fibers. Biofeedback therapists use temperature biofeedback when treating chronic pain, edema, headache, essential hypertension, Raynaud's disease, anxiety, and stress. Photoplethysmograph 
An electrodermograph measures skin electrical activity directly and indirectly using electrodes placed over the digits or hand and wrist. Orienting responses to unexpected stimuli, arousal, and worry, and cognitive activity can increase eccrine sweat gland activity, increasing the conductivity of the skin for electric current. In skin conductance, an electrodermograph imposes an imperceptible current across the skin and measures how easily it travels through the skin. When anxiety raises the level of sweat in a sweat duct, conductance increases. Skin conductance is measured in microsiemens. In skin potential, a therapist places an active electrode over an active site and a reference electrode over a relatively inactive site. Skin potential is the voltage that develops between eccrine sweat glands and internal tissues and is measured in millivolts. In skin resistance, also called galvanic skin response, an electrodermograph imposes a current across the skin and measures the amount of opposition it encounters. Skin resistance is measured in K-omega. Biofeedback therapists use electrodermal biofeedback when treating anxiety disorders, hyperhidrosis, and stress. Electrodermal biofeedback is used as an adjunct to psychotherapy to increase client awareness of their emotions. In addition, electrodermal measures have long served as one of the central tools in polygraphy because they reflect changes in anxiety or emotional activation. An electroencephalograph measures the electrical activation of the brain from scalp sites located over the human cortex. The EEG shows the amplitude of electrical activity at each cortical site, the amplitude and relative power of various waveforms at each site, and the degree to which each cortical site fires in conjunction with other cortical sites. The EEG uses precious metal electrodes to detect a voltage between at least two electrodes located on the scalp. The EEG records both excitatory postsynaptic potentials and inhibitory postsynaptic potentials that largely occur in dendrites in pyramidal cells located in macro columns, several millimeters in diameter, in the upper cortical layers. Neurofeedback monitors both slow and fast cortical potentials. Electrocardiogram Slow cortical potentials are gradual changes in the membrane potentials of cortical dendrites that last from 300 milliseconds to several seconds. These potentials include the contingent negative variation, readiness potential, movement-related potentials, and P300 and N400 potentials. Pneumograph Fast cortical potentials range from 0.5 Hz to 100 Hz. The main frequency ranges include delta, theta, alpha, the sensory motor rhythm, low beta, high beta, and gamma. The thresholds or boundaries defining the frequency ranges vary considerably among professionals. Fast cortical potentials can be described by their predominant frequencies, but also by whether they are synchronous or asynchronous waveforms. Synchronous waveforms occur at regular periodic intervals, whereas asynchronous waveforms are irregular. The synchronous delta rhythm ranges from 0.5 to 3.5 Hz. Delta is the dominant frequency from ages 1 to 2, and is associated in adults with deep sleep and brain pathology like trauma and tumors, and learning disability. The synchronous theta rhythm ranges from 4 to 7 Hz. Theta is the dominant frequency in healthy young children and is associated with drowsiness or starting to sleep, REM sleep, hypnagogic imagery, hypnosis, attention, and processing of cognitive and perceptual information. The synchronous alpha rhythm ranges from 8 to 13 Hz and is defined by its waveform and not by its frequency. 
Alpha activity can be observed in about 75% of awake, relaxed individuals and is replaced by low amplitude desynchronized beta activity during movement, complex problem solving, and visual focusing. This phenomenon is called alpha blocking. Capnometer Rheoencephalograph Hemoencephalography Pressure The synchronous sensory motor rhythm ranges from 12 to 15 Hz and is located over the sensory motor cortex. The sensory motor rhythm is associated with the inhibition of movement and reduced muscle tone. The beta rhythm consists of asynchronous waves and can be divided into low beta and high beta ranges. Low beta is associated with activation and focused thinking. High beta is associated with anxiety, hypervigilance, panic, peak performance, and worry. EEG activity from 36 to 44 Hz is also referred to as gamma. Gamma activity is associated with perception of meaning and meditative awareness. Neurotherapists use EEG biofeedback when treating addiction, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, learning disability, anxiety disorders, depression, migraine, and generalized seizures. A photoplethysmograph measures the relative blood flow through a digit using a photoplethysmographic sensor attached by a Velcro band to the fingers or to the temple to monitor the temporal artery. An infrared light source is transmitted through or reflected off the tissue, detected by a phototransistor, and quantified in arbitrary units. Less light is absorbed when blood flow is greater increasing the intensity of light reaching the sensor. A photoplethysmograph can measure blood volume pulse, which is the phasic change in blood volume with each heartbeat, heart rate, and heart rate variability, which consists of beat-to-beat -beat differences in intervals between successive heartbeats. A photoplethysmograph can provide useful feedback when temperature feedback shows minimal change. This is because the PPG sensor is more sensitive than a thermistor to minute blood flow changes. Biofeedback therapists can use a photoplethysmograph to supplement temperature biofeedback when treating chronic pain, edema, headache, essential hypertension, Raynaud's disease, anxiety, and stress. Applications the electrocardiogram uses electrodes placed on the torso, wrists, or legs, to measure the electrical activity of the heart and measures the interbeat interval. The interbeat interval, divided into 60 seconds, determines the heart rate at that moment. The statistical variability of that interbeat interval is what we call heart rate variability. The ECG method is more accurate than the PPG method in measuring heart rate variability. Biofeedback therapists use heart rate variability biofeedback when treating asthma, COPD, depression, anxiety, fibromyalgia, heart disease, and unexplained abdominal pain. Research shows that HRV biofeedback can also be used to improve physiological and psychological well-being in healthy individuals. HRV data from both polyplethysmographs and electrocardiograms are analyzed via mathematical transformations such as the commonly used fast Fourier transform. The FFT splits the HRV data into a power spectrum revealing the waveform's constituent frequencies. Among those constituent frequencies, high frequency and low frequency components are defined as above and below 0.15 Hz, respectively. As a rule of thumb, the LF component of HRV represents sympathetic activity, and the HF component represents parasympathetic activity. The two main components are often represented as a LF-HF ratio and used to express sympathovagal balance. Some researchers consider a third, 
medium frequency component from 0.08 Hz to 0.15 Hz, which has been shown to increase in power during times of appreciation. Urinary incontinence Fecal incontinence and anismus EEG a pneumograph or respiratory strain gauge uses a flexible sensor band that is placed around the chest, abdomen, or both. The strain gauge method can provide feedback about the relative expansion slash contraction of the chest and abdomen, and can measure respiration rate. Clinicians can use a pneumograph to detect and correct dysfunctional breathing patterns and behaviors. Dysfunctional breathing patterns include clavicular breathing, reverse breathing, and thoracic breathing. Dysfunctional breathing behaviors include apnea, gasping, sighing, and wheezing. A pneumograph is often used in conjunction with an electrocardiograph or photoplethysmograph in heart rate variability training. Biofeedback therapists use pneumograph biofeedback with patients diagnosed with anxiety disorders, asthma, chronic pulmonary obstructive disorder, essential hypertension, panic attacks, and stress. A capnometer or capnograph uses an infrared detector to measure end tidal CO2 exhaled through the nostril into a latex tube. The average value of end tidal CO Two for a resting adult is 5%. A capnometer is a sensitive index of the quality of patient breathing. Shallow, rapid, and effortful breathing lowers CO, 2, while deep, slow, effortless breathing increases it. Biofeedback therapists use capnometric biofeedback to supplement respiratory strain gauge biofeedback with patients diagnosed with anxiety disorders, asthma, chronic pulmonary obstructive disorder, essential hypertension, panic attacks, and stress. Electrodermal System Rheoencephalography, or Brain Blood Flow Biofeedback is a biofeedback technique of a conscious control of blood flow. An electronic device called a rheoencephalograph is utilized in brain blood flow biofeedback. Electrodes are attached to the skin at certain points on the head and permit the device to measure continuously the electrical conductivity of the tissues of structures located between the electrodes. The brain blood flow technique is based on non-invasive method of measuring bioimpedance. Changes in bioimpedance are generated by blood volume and blood flow and registered by a rheographic device. The pulsative bioimpedance changes directly reflect the total blood flow of the deep structures of brain due to high frequency impedance measurements. Hemoencephalography or HEG biofeedback is a functional infrared imaging technique. As its name describes, it measures the differences in the color of light reflected back through the scalp based on the relative amount of oxygenated and unoxygenated blood in the brain. Research continues to determine its reliability, validity, and clinical applicability. HEG is used to treat ADHD and migraine and for research. Pressure can be monitored as a patient performs exercises while resting against an air-filled cushion. This is pertinent to physiotherapy. Alternatively, the patient may actively grip or press against an air-filled cushion of custom shape. Moer detailed the use of a bedwetting alarm that sounds when children urinate while asleep. This simple biofeedback device can quickly teach children to wake up when their bladders are full and to contract the urinary sphincter and relax the detrusor muscle, preventing further urine release. Through classical conditioning, sensory feedback from a full bladder replaces the alarm and allows children to continue sleeping without urinating. Kegel developed the perineometer in 1947 to treat urinary incontinence in women whose pelvic floor muscles are weakened during pregnancy and childbirth. The perineometer, 
which is inserted into the vagina to monitor pelvic floor muscle contraction, satisfies all the requirements of a biofeedback device and enhances the effectiveness of popular Kegel exercises. Contradicting this, a 2013 randomized controlled trial found no benefit of adding biofeedback to pelvic floor muscle exercise and stress urinary incontinence. In another randomized controlled trial the addition of biofeedback to the training of pelvic floor muscles for the treatment of stress urinary incontinence, improved pelvic floor muscle function, reduced urinary symptoms, and improved of the quality of life. Research has shown that biofeedback can improve the efficacy of pelvic floor exercises and help restore proper bladder functions. The mode of action of vaginal cones, for instance involves a biological biofeedback mechanism. Studies have shown that biofeedback obtained with vaginal cones is as effective as biofeedback induced through physiotherapy electrostimulation. In 1992, the United States Agency for Healthcare Policy and Research recommended biofeedback as a first-line treatment for adult urinary incontinence. Biofeedback is a major treatment for anismus. This therapy directly evolved from the investigation anorectal manometry where a probe that can record pressure is placed in the anal canal. Biofeedback therapy is also a commonly used and researched therapy for fecal incontinence, but the benefits are uncertain. Biofeedback therapy varies in the way it is delivered. It is also unknown if one type has benefits over another. The aims have been described as to enhance either the rectoanal inhibitory reflex, rectal sensitivity, or the strength and endurance of the EAS contraction. Three general types of biofeedback have been described, though they are not mutually exclusive, with many protocols combining these elements. Similarly there is variance of the length of both the individual sessions and the overall length of the training, and if home exercises are performed in addition and how. In rectal sensitivity training, a balloon is placed in the rectum, and is gradually distended until there is a sensation of rectal filling. Successively smaller volume reinflations of the balloon aim to help the person detect rectal distension at a lower threshold, giving more time to contract the EAS and prevent incontinence, or to journey to the toilet. Alternatively, in those with urge incontinence slash rectal hypersensitivity, Training is aimed at teaching the person to tolerate progressively larger volumes. Strength training may involve electromyography skin electrodes, manometric pressures, intraanal EMG, or endoanal ultrasound. One of these measures are used to relay the muscular activity or anal canal pressure during anal sphincter exercise. Performance and progress can be monitored in this manner. Coordination training involves the placing of three balloons, in the rectum and in the upper and lower anal canal. The rectal balloon is inflated to trigger the RAIR, an event often followed by incontinence. Coordination training aims to teach voluntary contraction of EAS when the RAIR occurs. Cotone recorded spontaneous electrical potentials from the exposed cortical surface of monkeys and rabbits, and was the first to measure event-related potentials in 1875. Danny Levski published Investigations in the Physiology of the Brain, which explored the relationship between the EEG and states of consciousness in 1877. Musculoskeletal system Cardiovascular system Beck published studies of spontaneous electrical potentials detected from the brains of dogs and rabbits, and was the first to document alpha blocking, where light alters rhythmic oscillations, in 1890. 
Sherrington introduced the terms neuron and synapse and published the integrative action of the nervous system in 1906. Pain Pravdik Neminsky photographed the EEG and event-related potentials from dogs, demonstrated a 12-14 Hz rhythm that slowed during asphyxiation, and introduced the term electrocerebrogram in 1912. Chronic back pain Muscle pain Tension headache Migraine Phantom limb pain Financial decision making Stress reduction Macular disease of the retina Clinical effectiveness Research Efficacy Criticisms Organizations Certification Forbes reported the replacement of the string galvanometer with a vacuum tube to amplify the EEG in 1920. The vacuum tube became the de facto standard by 1936. Berger published the first human EEG data. He recorded electrical potentials from his son Klaus's scalp. At first he believed that he had discovered the physical mechanism for telepathy but was disappointed that the electromagnetic variations disappear only millimeters away from the skull. He viewed the EEG as analogous to the ECG and introduced the term electroencephalogram. He believed that the EEG had diagnostic and therapeutic promise in measuring the impact of clinical interventions. Berger showed that these potentials were not due to scalp muscle contractions. He first identified the alpha rhythm, which he called the Berger rhythm, and later identified the beta rhythm and sleep spindles. He demonstrated that alterations in consciousness are associated with changes in the EEG and associated the beta rhythm with alertness. He described interictal activity and recorded a partial complex seizure in 1933. Finally, he performed the first QEEG, which is the measurement of the signal strength of EEG frequencies. Adrian and Matthews confirmed Berger's findings in 1934 by recording their own EEGs using a cathode ray oscilloscope. Their demonstration of EEG recording at the 1935 Physiological Society meetings in England caused its widespread acceptance. Adrian used himself as a subject and demonstrated the phenomenon of alpha blocking, where opening his eyes suppressed alpha rhythms. Gibbs, Davis, and Lennox inaugurated clinical electroencephalography in 1935 by identifying abnormal EEG rhythms associated with epilepsy, including interictal spike waves and 3 Hz activity in absence seizures. Bremer used the EEG to show how sensory signals affect vigilance in 1935. Walter named the delta waves and theta waves and the contingent negative variation, a slow cortical potential that may reflect expectancy, motivation, intention to act, or attention. He located an occipital lobe source for alpha waves and demonstrated that delta waves can help locate brain lesions like tumors. He improved Berger's electroencephalograph and pioneered EEG topography. Kleetman has been recognized as the father of American sleep research for his seminal work in the regulation of sleep-wake cycles, circadian rhythms, the sleep patterns of different age groups, and the effects of sleep deprivation. He discovered the phenomenon of rapid eye movement sleep with his graduate student A. Sarinsky in 1953. Dement, another of Kleetman's students, described the EEG architecture and phenomenology of sleep stages and the transitions between them in 1955, associated REM sleep with dreaming in 1957, and documented sleep cycles in another species, cats, in 1958, 
which stimulated basic sleep research. He established the Stanford University Sleep Research Center in 1970. Anderson and Anderson proposed that thalamic pacemakers project synchronous alpha rhythms to the cortex via thalamocortical circuits. Kamaya demonstrated that the alpha rhythm in humans could be operantly conditioned. He published an influential article in Psychology Today that summarized research that showed that subjects could learn to discriminate when alpha was present or absent, and that they could use feedback to shift the dominant alpha frequency about 1 Hz. Almost half of his subjects reported experiencing a pleasant alpha state characterized as an alert calmness. These reports may have contributed to the perception of alpha biofeedback as a shortcut to a meditative state. He also studied the EEG correlates of meditative states. Brown demonstrated the clinical use of alpha theta biofeedback. In research designed to identify the subjective states associated with EEG rhythms, she trained subjects to increase the abundance of alpha, beta, and theta activity using visual feedback and recorded their subjective experiences when the amplitude of these frequency bands increased. She also helped popularize biofeedback by publishing a series of books, including New Mind, New Body, and Stress and the Art of Biofeedback. Mulholland and Pepper showed that occipital alpha increases with eyes open and not focused, and is disrupted by visual focusing, a rediscovery of alpha blocking. Green and Green investigated voluntary control of internal states by individuals like Swami Rama and American Indian medicine man Rolling Thunder both in India and at the Menninger Foundation. They brought portable biofeedback equipment to India and monitored practitioners as they demonstrated self-regulation. A film containing footage from their investigations was released as Biofeedback, The Yoga of the West. They developed Alpha Theta training at the Menninger Foundation from the 1960s to the 1990s. They hypothesized that Theta states allow access to unconscious memories and increase the impact of prepared images or suggestions. Their Alpha Theta research fostered Peniston's development of an Alpha Theta addiction protocol. Sturman showed that cats and human subjects could be operantly trained to increase the amplitude of the sensory motor rhythm recorded from the sensory motor cortex. He demonstrated that SMR production protects cats against drug induced generalized seizures and reduces the frequency of seizures in humans diagnosed with epilepsy. He found that his SMR protocol, which uses visual and auditory EEG biofeedback, normalizes their EEGs even during sleep. Sturman also CO developed the Sturman Kaiser QEEG database. Burbaumer and colleagues have studied feedback of slow cortical potentials since the late 1970s. They have demonstrated that subjects can learn to control these DC potentials and have studied the efficacy of slow cortical potential biofeedback in treating ADHD, epilepsy, migraine, and schizophrenia. Luber studied SMR biofeedback to treat attention disorders and epilepsy in collaboration with Sturman. He demonstrated that SMR training can improve attention and academic performance in children diagnosed with attention deficit disorder with hyperactivity. He documented the importance of theta to beta ratios in ADHD and developed theta suppression beta enhancement protocols to decrease these ratios and improve student performance. The neuropsychiatric EEG-based assessment aid system a device used to measure the theta to beta ratio was approved as a tool to assist in diagnosis of ADHD on July 15, 2013. However, the field has recently moved away from the measure. This move has been caused by the general change in the population norms in the past 20 years. 
Thier demonstrated the exosomatic method of recording of skin electrical activity by passing a small current through the skin in 1888. Tarchanov used the endosomatic method by recording the difference in skin electrical potential from points on the skin surface in 1889, no external current was applied. Jung employed the galvanometer, which used the exosomatic method, in 1907 to study unconscious emotions in word association experiments. Marjorie and Herschel Tumum published a landmark article about the use of GSR biofeedback in psychotherapy. Meyer and Reich discussed similar material in a British publication. Jacobson developed hardware to measure EMG voltages over time, showed that cognitive activity affects EMG levels, introduced the deep relaxation method progressive relaxation, and wrote progressive relaxation and you must relax. He prescribed daily progressive relaxation practice to treat diverse psychophysiological disorders like hypertension. Several researchers showed that human subjects could learn precise control of individual motor units. Lindsley found that relaxed subjects could suppress motor unit firing without biofeedback training. Harrison and Mortensen trained subjects using visual and auditory EMG biofeedback to control individual motor units in the tibialis anterior muscle of the leg. Basmagian instructed subjects using unfiltered auditory EMG biofeedback to control separate motor units in the abductor pollicis muscle of the thumb in his single motor unit training studies. His best subjects coordinated several motor units to produce drum rolls. Basmagian demonstrated practical applications for neuromuscular rehabilitation, pain management, and headache treatment. Marinacci applied EMG biofeedback to neuromuscular disorders including Bell palsy, polio, and stroke. While Marinacci used EMG to treat neuromuscular disorders, his colleagues used the EMG only for diagnosis. They were unable to recognize its potential as a teaching tool even when the evidence stared them in the face. Many electromyographers who performed nerve conduction studies used visual and auditory feedback to reduce interference when a patient recruited too many motor units. Even though they used EMG biofeedback to guide the patient to relax so that clean diagnostic EMG tests could be recorded, they were unable to envision EMG biofeedback treatment of motor disorders. Watmore and Coley introduced the concept of disposes to explain how functional disorders develop. Bracing your shoulders when you hear a loud sound illustrates disposes, since this action does not protect against injury. These clinicians applied EMG biofeedback to diverse functional problems like headache and hypertension. They reported case follow UPS ranging from 6 to 21 years. This was long compared with typical 0 to 24 month follow UPS in the clinical literature. Their data showed that skill in controlling misplaced efforts was positively related to clinical improvement. Last, they wrote the pathophysiology and treatment of functional disorders that outlined their treatment of functional disorders. Wolf integrated EMG biofeedback into physical therapy to treat stroke patients and conducted landmark stroke outcome studies. Pepper applied SEMG to the workplace, studied the ergonomics of computer use, and promoted healthy computing. TOG demonstrated the clinical efficacy of constraint-induced movement therapy for the treatment of spinal cord injured and stroke patients. Schoen operantly trained human subjects to increase their heart rates by 5 beats per minute to avoid electric shock. In contrast to Schoen's slight heart rate increases, Swami Rama used yoga to produce atrial flutter at an average 306 beats per minute before a Menninger Foundation audience.
This briefly stopped his heart's pumping of blood and silenced his pulse. Engel and Chisholm apparently train subjects to decrease, increase, and then decrease their heart rates. He then used this approach to teach patients to control their rate of premature ventricular contractions, where the ventricles contract too soon. Engel conceptualized this training protocol as illness onset training since patients were taught to produce and then suppress a symptom. Pepper has similarly taught asthmatics who wheeze to better control their breathing. Schwartz examined whether specific patterns of cardiovascular activity are easier to learn than others due to biological constraints. He examined the constraints on learning integrated and differentiated patterns of blood pressure and heart rate change. Schultz and Luth developed autogenic training, which is a deep relaxation exercise derived from hypnosis. This procedure combines passive volition with imagery in a series of three treatment procedures. Clinicians at the Menninger Foundation coupled an abbreviated list of standard exercises with thermal biofeedback to create autogenic biofeedback. Luth also published a series of six volumes titled Autogenic Therapy. Farian and colleagues reported on an 18-26 to 26 session treatment program for hypertensive patients. The Menninger program combined breathing modification, autogenic biofeedback for the hands and feet, and frontal EMG training. The authors reported that 89% of their medication patients discontinued or reduced medication by one half while significantly lowering blood pressure. While this study did not include a double-blind control, the outcome rate was impressive. Friedman and colleagues demonstrated that hand warming and hand cooling are produced by different mechanisms. The primary hand warming mechanism is beta adrenergic, while the main hand cooling mechanism is alpha adrenergic and involves sympathetic C fibers. This contradicts the traditional view that finger blood flow is controlled exclusively by sympathetic C fibers. The traditional model asserts that, when firing is slow, hands warm, when firing is rapid, hands cool. Friedman and colleagues' studies support the view that hand warming and hand cooling represent entirely different skills. Vasquillo and colleagues published the first studies of heart rate variability biofeedback with cosmonauts and treated patients diagnosed with psychiatric and psychophysiological disorders. Lehrer collaborated with Smetankine and Potapova in treating pediatric asthma patients and published influential articles on HRV asthma treatment in the medical journal Chest. The most direct effect of HRV biofeedback is on the baroreflex, a homeostatic reflex that helps control blood pressure fluctuations. When blood pressure goes up, the baroreflex makes heart rate go down. The opposite happens when blood pressure goes down. Because it takes about 5 seconds for blood pressure to change after changes in heart rate, the baroreflex produces a rhythm in heart rate with a period of about 10 seconds. Another rhythm in heart rate is caused by respiration, such that heart rate rises during inhalation and falls during exhalation. During HRV biofeedback, these two reflexes stimulate each other, stimulating resonance properties of the cardiovascular system caused by the inherent rhythm in the baroreflex, and thus causing very big oscillations in heart rate and large amplitude stimulation of the baroreflex. Thus HRV biofeedback exercises the baroreflex, and strengthens it. This apparently has the effect of modulating autonomic reactivity to stimulation. Because the baroreflex is controlled through brain stem mechanisms that communicate directly with the insula and amygdala, which control emotion, HRV biofeedback also appears to modulate emotional reactivity, and to help people suffering from anxiety, stress, and depression.
Emotions are intimately linked to heart health, which is linked to physical and mental health. In general, good mental and physical health are correlated with positive emotions and high heart rate variability modulated by mostly high frequencies. High HRV has been correlated with increased executive functioning skills such as memory and reaction time. Biofeedback that increased HRV and shifted power toward HF has been shown to lower blood pressure on the other hand, LF power in the heart is associated with sympathetic vagal activity, which is known to increase the risk of heart attack. LF-dominated HRV power spectra are also directly associated with higher mortality rates in healthy individuals, and among individuals with mood disorders. Anger and frustration increase the LF range of HRV. Other studies have shown anger to increase the risk of heart attack, so researchers at the HeartMath Institute have made the connection between emotions and physical health via HRV. Because emotions have such an impact on cardiac function, which cascades to numerous other biological processes, emotional regulation techniques are able to affect practical, psychophysiological change. McCready et al. discovered that feelings of gratitude increased HRV and moved its power spectrum toward the MF and HF ranges, while decreasing LF power. The Heart Math Institute's patented techniques involve engendering feelings of gratitude and happiness, focusing on the physical location of the heart, and breathing in 10-second cycles. Other techniques have been shown to improve HRV, such as strenuous aerobic exercise, and meditation. Newton John, Spence, and Schott compared the effectiveness of cognitive behavior therapy and electromyographic biofeedback for 44 participants with chronic low back pain. Newton John ETAL split the participants into two groups, then measured the intensity of pain the participants perceived disability, and depression before treatment, after treatment, and again six months later. Newton John ETAL found no significant differences between the group which received CBT and the group which received EMG biofeedback. This seems to indicate that biofeedback is as effective as CBT in chronic low back pain. Comparing the results of the groups before treatment and after treatment, indicates that EMG biofeedback reduced pain, disability, and depression as much as by half. Bajinsky and Stoiva showed that EMG biofeedback could reduce frontalis muscle contraction. They demonstrated in 1973 that analog and binary visual EMG biofeedback were equally helpful in lowering Meseter SEMG levels. McNulty, Gevertz, Hubbard, and Burkhoff proposed that sympathetic nervous system innervation of muscle spindles underlies trigger points. Bajinsky, Stoiva, Adler, and Mullaney reported that auditory frontalis EMG biofeedback combined with home relaxation practice lowered tension headache frequency and frontalis EMG levels. A control group that received non-contingent auditory feedback did not improve. This study helped make the frontalis muscle the placement of choice in EMG assessment and treatment of headache and other psychophysiological disorders. Sargent, Green, and Walters demonstrated that hand warming could abort migraines and that autogenic biofeedback training could reduce headache activity. The early Menninger migraine studies, although methodologically weak, strongly influenced migraine treatment. A 2013 review classified biofeedback among the techniques that might be of benefit in the management of chronic migraine. Floor trained amputees to detect the location and frequency of shocks delivered to their stumps, which resulted in an expansion of corresponding cortical regions and significant reduction of their phantom limb pain.
Financial traders use biofeedback as a tool for regulating their level of emotional arousal in order to make better financial decisions. The technology company Philips and the Dutch bank ABN AMRO developed a biofeedback device for retail investors based on a galvanic skin response sensor. Aster ETAL developed a biofeedback-based serious game in which financial decision-makers can learn how to effectively regulate their emotions using heart rate measurements. A randomized study by Sitarto ETAL assessed the effect of resonant breathing biofeedback among manufacturing operators, depression, anxiety, and stress significantly decreased. A 2012 observational study by Pacella ETAL found a significant improvement in both visual acuity and fixation treating patients suffering from age-related macular degeneration or macular degeneration with biofeedback treatment through MP1 microperimeter. Moss, L. Evoch, and Hammond observed that biofeedback and neurofeedback seem to offer the kind of evidence-based practice that the healthcare establishment is demanding. From the beginning biofeedback developed as a research-based approach emerging directly from laboratory research on psychophysiology and behavior therapy, the ties of biofeedback slash neurofeedback to the biomedical paradigm and to research are stronger than is the case for many other behavioral interventions. The Association for Applied Psychophysiology and Biofeedback and the International Society for Neurofeedback and Research have collaborated in validating and rating treatment protocols to address questions about the clinical efficacy of biofeedback and neurofeedback applications, like ADHD and headache. In 2001, Donald Moss then president of the Association for Applied Psychophysiology and Biofeedback, and Jake Unkelman, president of the International Society for Neurofeedback and Research, appointed a task force to establish standards for the efficacy of biofeedback and neurofeedback. The task force document was published in 2002, and a series of white papers followed reviewing the efficacy of a series of disorders. The white papers established the efficacy of biofeedback for functional anorectal disorders, attention deficit disorder, facial pain and temporomandibular joint dysfunction, hypertension, urinary incontinence, Raynaud's phenomenon, substance abuse, and headache. A broader review was published and later updated, applying the same efficacy standards to the entire range of medical and psychological disorders. The 2008 edition reviewed the efficacy of biofeedback for over 40 clinical disorders, ranging from alcoholism slash substance abuse to vulvar vestibulitis. The ratings for each disorder depend on the nature of research studies available on each disorder, ranging from anecdotal reports to double-blind studies with a control group. Thus, a lower rating may reflect the lack of research rather than the ineffectiveness of biofeedback for the problem. The randomized trial by Delhi ETAL compared if the injection of a bulking agent in the anal canal was superior to sphincter training with biofeedback to treat fecal incontinence. Both methods lead to an improvement of phi, but comparisons of St. Mark's scores between the groups showed no differences in effect between treatments. Ucha and Montgomery's ratings are listed for the five levels of efficacy recommended by a joint task force and adopted by the boards of directors of the Association for Applied Psychophysiology and the International Society for Neuronal Regulation. From weakest to strongest, these levels include, not empirically supported, possibly efficacious, probably efficacious, efficacious and efficacious and specific. Level 1, not empirically supported. This designation includes applications supported by anecdotal reports and slash or case studies in non-peer-reviewed venues. 
Ucha and Montgomery assigned eating disorders, immune function, spinal cord injury, and syncope to this category. Level 2, Possibly Efficacious This designation requires at least one study of sufficient statistical power with well-identified outcome measures but lacking randomized assignment to a control condition internal to the study. Ucha and Montgomery assigned asthma, autism, Bell palsy, cerebral palsy, COPD, coronary artery disease, cystic fibrosis, depression, erectile dysfunction, fibromyalgia, hand dystonia, irritable bowel syndrome, PTSD, repetitive strain injury, respiratory failure, stroke, tinnitus, and urinary incontinence in children to this category. Level 3, Probably Efficacious This designation requires multiple observational studies, clinical studies, waitlist controlled studies, and within subject and intrasubject replication studies that demonstrate efficacy. Ucha and Montgomery assigned alcoholism and substance abuse, arthritis, diabetes mellitus, fecal disorders in children, fecal incontinence in adults, insomnia, pediatric headache, traumatic brain injury, urinary incontinence in males, and vulvar vestibulitis to this category. Pelvic muscle dysfunction History Timeline Future In popular culture Footnotes Level 4, Efficacious This designation requires the satisfaction of six criteria. In a comparison with a no-treatment control group, alternative treatment group, or sham control using randomized assignment, the investigational treatment is shown to be statistically significantly superior to the control condition or the investigational treatment is equivalent to a treatment of established efficacy in a study with sufficient power to detect moderate differences. The studies have been conducted with a population treated for a specific problem, for whom inclusion criteria are delineated in a reliable, operationally defined manner. The study used valid and clearly specified outcome measures related to the problem being treated. The data are subjected to appropriate data analysis. The diagnostic and treatment variables and procedures are clearly defined in a manner that permits replication of the study by independent researchers. The superiority or equivalence of the investigational treatment has been shown in at least two independent research settings. Ucha and Montgomery assigned attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, anxiety, chronic pain, epilepsy, constipation, headache, hypertension, motion sickness, Raynaud's disease, and temporomandibular joint dysfunction to this category. Level 5 efficacious and specific. The investigational treatment must be shown to be statistically superior to credible sham therapy, pill, or alternative bona fide treatment in at least two independent research settings. Ucha and Montgomery assigned urinary incontinence to this category. In a healthcare environment that emphasizes cost containment and evidence-based practice, biofeedback and neurofeedback professionals continue to address skepticism in the medical community about the cost-effectiveness and efficacy of their treatments. Critics question how these treatments compare with conventional behavioral and medical interventions on efficacy and cost. The publication of white papers and rigorous evaluation of biofeedback interventions can address these legitimate questions and educate medical professionals, third-party payers, and the public about the value of these services. The Association for Applied Psychophysiology and Biofeedback is a non-profit scientific and professional society for biofeedback and neurofeedback.
The International Society for Neurofeedback and Research is a non-profit scientific and professional society for neurofeedback. The Biofeedback Foundation of Europe sponsors international education, training, and research activities in biofeedback and neurofeedback. The Northeast Regional Biofeedback Association sponsors theme-centered educational conferences, political advocacy for biofeedback-friendly legislation, and research activities in biofeedback and neurofeedback in the Northeast regions of the United States. The Southeast Biofeedback and Clinical Neuroscience Association is a non-profit regional organization supporting biofeedback professionals with continuing education, ethics guidelines, and public awareness promoting the efficacy and safety of professional biofeedback. The ZPNA offers an annual conference for professional continuing education as well as promoting biofeedback as an adjunct to the allied health professions. The ZPNA was formerly the North Carolina Biofeedback Society, serving biofeedback since the 1970s. In 2013, the NCBS reorganized as the ZPNA supporting and representing biofeedback and neurofeedback in the southeast region of the United States of America. The Biofeedback Certification International Alliance is a non-profit organization that is a member of the Institute for Credentialing Excellence. BCIA offers biofeedback certification, neurofeedback certification, and pelvic muscle dysfunction biofeedback. BCIA certifies individuals meeting education and training standards in biofeedback and neurofeedback and progressively recertifies those satisfying continuing education requirements. BCIA certification has been endorsed by the Mayo Clinic, the Association for Applied Psychophysiology and Biofeedback, the International Society for Neurofeedback and Research and the Washington State Legislature. The BCIA didactic education requirement includes a 48-hour course from a regionally accredited academic institution or a BCIA-approved training program that covers the complete general biofeedback blueprint of knowledge and study of human anatomy and physiology. The general biofeedback blueprint of knowledge areas include eye orientation to biofeedback, 2. Stress, coping, and illness, 3. Psychophysiological recording, 4. Surface electromyographic applications, v. Autonomic nervous system applications, 6. Electroencephalographic applications, 7. Adjunctive interventions, and 8. Professional conduct. Applicants may demonstrate their knowledge of human anatomy and physiology by completing a course in human anatomy, human physiology, or human biology provided by a regionally accredited academic institution or a BCIA-approved training program or by successfully completing an anatomy and physiology exam covering the organization of the human body and its systems. Applicants must also document practical skills training that includes 20 contact hours supervised by a BCIA-approved mentor designed to them teach how to apply clinical biofeedback skills through self-regulation training, 50 patient-slash-client sessions, and case conference presentations. Distance learning allows applicants to complete didactic coursework over the Internet. Distance mentoring trains candidates from their residence or office. They must recertify every four years, complete 55 hours of continuing education during each review period or complete the written exam, and attest that their license-slash-credential has not been suspended, investigated, or revoked. Pelvic muscle dysfunction biofeedback encompasses elimination disorders and chronic pelvic pain syndromes. 
The BCIA didactic education requirement includes a 28-hour course from a regionally accredited academic institution or a BCIA-approved training program that covers the complete pelvic muscle dysfunction biofeedback blueprint of knowledge and study of human anatomy and physiology. The pelvic muscle dysfunction biofeedback areas include, I applied psychophysiology and biofeedback, 2. Pelvic Floor Anatomy, Assessment, and Clinical Procedures, 3. Clinical Disorders, Bladder Dysfunction, 4. Clinical Disorders, Bowel Dysfunction, and V. Chronic Pelvic Pain Syndromes. Currently, only licensed healthcare providers may apply for this certification. Applicants must also document practical skills training that includes a 4-hour practicum slash personal training session and 12 contact hours spent with a BCIA-approved mentor designed to teach them how to apply clinical biofeedback skills through 30 patient slash client sessions and case conference presentations. They must recertify every three years complete 36 hours of continuing education or complete the written exam, and attest that their license slash credential has not been suspended, investigated, or revoked. Claude Bernard proposed in 1865 that the body strives to maintain a steady state in the internal environment, introducing the concept of homeostasis. In 1885, J.R. Tarchanov showed that voluntary control of heart rate could be fairly direct and did not depend on cheating by altering breathing rate. In 1901, J.H. Baer studied voluntary control of the retrahens or M muscle that wiggles the ear, discovering that subjects learned this skill by inhibiting interfering muscles and demonstrating that skeletal muscles are self-regulated. Alexander Graham Bell attempted to teach the deaf to speak through the use of two devices the phonautograph, created by Edouard Leon Scots, and a manometric flame. The former translated sound vibrations into tracings on smoked glass to show their acoustic waveforms, while the latter allowed sound to be displayed as patterns of light. After World War II, Mathematician Norbert Wiener developed cybernetic theory, that proposed that systems are controlled by monitoring their results. The participants at the landmark 1969 conference at the Sephrida Inn in Santa Monica coined the term biofeedback from Wiener's feedback. The conference resulted in the founding of the Biofeedback Research Society which permitted normally isolated researchers to contact and collaborate with each other, as well as popularizing the term biofeedback. The work of B.F. Skinner led researchers to apply operant conditioning to biofeedback, decide which responses could be voluntarily controlled and which could not. In the first experimental demonstration of biofeedback Schoen used these procedures with heart rate. The effects of the perception of autonomic nervous system activity was initially explored by George Mandler S. Group in 1958. In 1965, Maya combined classical and operant conditioning to train subjects to change blood vessel diameter, eliciting and displaying reflexive blood flow changes to teach subjects how to voluntarily control the temperature of their skin. In 1974, H.D. Kimmel trained subjects to sweat using the galvanic skin response. Hinduism Biofeedback systems have been known in India and some other countries for millennia. Ancient Hindu practices like yoga and pranayama are essentially biofeedback methods. Many yogis and sadhus have been known to exercise control over their physiological processes. In addition to recent research on yoga, Paul Brunton, the British writer who travelled extensively in India, has written about many cases he has witnessed.
1958 G. Mandler's group studied the process of autonomic feedback and its effects. 1962 D. Schoen used feedback instead of conditioned stimuli to change heart rate. 1962 Publication of Muscles Alive by John Basmagian and Carlo De Luca. 1968 Annual Veterans Administration Research Meeting in Denver that brought together several biofeedback researchers. 1969 April Conference on Altered States of Consciousness, Council Grove, K.S., October, Formation and First Meeting of the Biofeedback Research Society, Sifrida in, Santa Monica, C.A., Co-Founder Barbara B. Brown becomes the Society's first president. 1972 Review and Analysis of Early Biofeedback Studies by D. Schoen in the Handbook of Psychophysiology 1974 Publication of the Alpha Syllabus, A Handbook of Human EEG Alpha Activity and the first popular book on biofeedback, New Mind, New Body, both by Barbara B. Brown 1975 American Association of Biofeedback Clinicians founded, publication of the Biofeedback Syllabus, a handbook for the psychophysiologic study of biofeedback by Barbara B. Brown. 1976 BRS renamed the Biofeedback Society of America. 1977 Publication of Beyond Biofeedback by Elmer and Alice Green and Biofeedback, Methods and Procedures in Clinical Practice by George Fuller and Stress and the Art of Biofeedback by Barbara B. Brown. 1978 Publication of Biofeedback, A Survey of the Literature by Francine Butler. 1979 Publication of Biofeedback. Principles and Practice for Clinicians by John Basmagian and Mind-slash-Body Integration, Essential Readings in Biofeedback by Eric Pepper, Sonia Ankali, and Michelle Quinn. 1981 National Certification Examination in Biofeedback offered by the Biofeedback Certification Institute of America, Publication of Biofeedback. Clinical Applications in Behavioral Medicine by David Olton and Aaron Noonberg and Supermind, The Ultimate Energy by Barbara B. Brown. 1984 Publication of Principles and Practice of Stress Management by Woolfolk and Lehrer and Between Health and Illness, New Notions on Stress and the Nature of Well-Being by Barbara B. Brown. 1984 Publication of the Biofeedback Way to Starve Stress, by Mark Golan in Prevention Magazine 1984. 1987 Publication of Biofeedback, A Practitioner's Guide by Mark Schwartz. 1989 BSA renamed the Association for Applied Psychophysiology and Biofeedback. 1991 First National Certification Examination in Stress Management offered by BCIA. 1994 Brainwave and EMG sections established within AAPB. 1995 Society for the Study of Neuronal Regulation founded. 1996 Biofeedback Foundation of Europe established. 1999 SSNR renamed the Society for Neuronal Regulation. 2002 SNR renamed the International Society for Neuronal Regulation. 2003 Publication of the Neurofeedback Book by Thompson & Thompson. 2004 Publication of Evidence-Based Practice in Biofeedback and Neurofeedback by Carolyn Ucha and Christopher Gilbert. 2006 ISNR renamed the International Society for Neurofeedback and Research. 2008 Biofeedback Neurofeedback Alliance formed to pool the resources of the AAPB, BCIA, and ISNR on joint initiatives. 
2008 Biofeedback Alliance and Nomenclature Task Force define biofeedback. 2009 The International Society for Neurofeedback and Research defines neurofeedback. 2010 Biofeedback Certification Institute of America renamed the Biofeedback Certification International Alliance. Christopher Deckarms in conjunction with Stanford University School of Medicine has developed a real-time fMRI for the purpose of training the brain to activate its own endogenous opiates. Deckarms believes this will revolutionize the treatment of chronic pain. The patient can control his own pain by visually looking at his RT-fMRI, watching his own reactions in real time, and then blocking the pathways causing pain. Deck Arms mentions that clinical trials with RT-fMRI is measuring a 44 to 64 percent decrease in chronic pain. With eight participants in the study, Deck Arms ETAL demonstrated that subjects can control the pain of heat stimulus by visually observing in real time their brain activity. The subjects were instructed to use techniques such as changing the focus of their attention to the pain and changing the emotional value of the pain. Then while viewing their own fMRI in real time the subjects could observe the effect of their thoughts on the part of the brain called the rostral anterior cingulate cortex. When the subject controlled the pain the virtual flame on the fMRI got dimmer. Results from this study indicate two things, one. That subjects can learn to voluntarily control brain activity in a specific region of the brain, and two, there is a significant increase in the ability of healthy subjects to control their pain with repeated training. This study was then repeated with eight patients with chronic intractable pain. The results showed that these patients were successful in reducing their pain rating by 64%. The authors state that this is not yet a treatment, but still under serious investigation.